And welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, host of the show. It is show number 78. Happy to be on here. We are at the Port Jervis Library. Uh, we are live on Facebook. We are on iTunes and our friends in Canada on Voice Ed Radio Canada. Super pumped to be back on and uh, very excited to welcome in today's guest here in a few moments, Dr. Mikey Fowlin. Uh, very excited. I've uh, had a chance to get to know Dr. Mikey uh, for a few years now uh, uh, as his work around Orange County and, and New York State uh, as a performer, as a poet, and as a psychologist. He's been to Port Jervis a number of times, and uh, I've had a chance to talk with him about his work uh, and his journey uh, and all that he does for kids in schools. So we're going to meet Dr. Mikey uh, here coming up. He's uh, the guest today on show number 78. That being said, if you are liking the show, please leave us a positive review on iTunes uh, as well as Amazon uh, with my book. I got it here behind me, The Principles of Surviving and Thriving. I know that's on Mikey's uh, reading list here for uh, this winter. So that being said, the name of today's show is the voice that we bring. And if you've seen Dr. Mikey around Orange County or in New York State or, or anywhere uh, where he does his talks, you know he has a talent for doing voices. Um, Dr. Mikey, again, uh, he is a psychologist, he's a performer, he's a poet, and he comes to schools and he helps kids. He helps kids open up about the things going on in their lives and some of the challenges that they have in terms of uh, anxieties, uh, their mental health, um, uh, all of that kind of stuff in terms of kids' wellness, and really the adults too. I know he knows he's helping the adults too. But the voice that he brings, he brings so many different voices. And you're going to get to meet Dr. Mikey here in a, in a moment. But that's the topic for my portion of the show today. What is the voice that we bring each and every day? What do people hear when we are talking to them? What is the story that we share as school leaders? We have such an impact on our staff and students with our mindset, with our attitude, with our positivity, and we, we can impact them so greatly with that. What are we willing to share about ourselves? What are we willing to share uh, about maybe some of the things that have happened in our past, maybe some of our own anxieties, right? Us as the school leader and as the principal, I'm up in front and I want to look strong and perfect and confident and all of those things. But deep down inside, we all know we have things going on. And do you let on about that? Do you share that with others? Do you open up to your students and your staff? Those are the things that Mikey brings uh, to the table. And he's an amazing speaker. If you're listening and you uh, work in a school district, uh, you're a school leader. If you haven't had Mikey in, I certainly am going to recommend him uh, to you. And hopefully you can get a little taste of uh, of what he brings to the table. But when he speaks, right, honesty, uh, sharing his story, Mikey opens up and shares his story, and he has a tremendous impact on his audience. I saw some of the toughest kids in my school, some of the football players, some of the, the big, strong, tough guys, even, the, even girls, all shapes and sizes, giving Mikey a hug thanking him, uh, asking to speak to him afterwards. So many kids lined up to speak with Mikey. And we can do that. We might not have the talent that Mikey Fallon has. We might not have the stage presence that Mikey Fallon has. But we can be honest with our students and staff. We have a story to tell. And each and every day, we get to have an impact on others. So as our role as school leaders, what is the voice that we bring, right? Think about that each and every day. Think about that the next time you talk to a group, the next time you talk to your staff. What is your story? What is the voice that you are going to bring? And uh, we're going to bring Mikey Fallon on here. You get to hear uh, a little bit of his voice and his message. Uh, Dr. Mikey, again, he is a, has his doctorate. Uh, he is a psychologist. 
He is an actor. He's a performer. He's been acting on stage since uh, the age of 11, but started using crank calling voices at the age of nine. His professional acting talents and his psychological training, uh, he's been in schools all over the country, uh, and he is on a mission to create an atmosphere of worldwide inclusion and not just tolerance towards all people. That being said, let's bring him into the podcast here. There he is. Hey, hey. Dr. Dr. Mikey, welcome to the program. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thank you for having me at this program, for real. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, thanks uh, for your work, Mikey. And uh, you were in Port Jervis this fall. And just uh, once again, a tremendous performance. I appreciate you squeezing us in uh, your busy schedule. Did you have a show today? Did you have a performance today? I did. I was down in South Jersey doing a uh, presentation for a middle school down there. And so that went well. And again, I mean, I was on, you know, so sometimes when you feel on like that and it so when I feel on and I'm watching the students responding to me feeling on, it's just this beautiful, beautiful connection that the vibe is just, it was, it was beautiful watching these sixth, seventh and eighth grade kids just open up emotionally and intellectually watching the presentation. And, and I've only ever seen you on Mikey. I think I've seen you show four times now and, and I don't want to be disrespectful calling it a show. I'm a, if you call it a training, a performance, whatever it is, um, but you've been doing this a long time, Mikey. When did you know you had something special? Like, wow, I, I think I'm pretty good at this. Or I'm impacting these kids' lives. When did it hit you that I got something going on pretty good? You know, there's been like a few moments. There have been like a number of moments throughout where I've realized that. I think one of the bigger moments, though, was early on before I even was doing it in schools. I was uh, working at as a counselor at a camp called Anytown. And they had asked me literally like a few hours before I had to do this presentation for the students. Hey, can you come up with something on gender? And I was like, ah, gender and sexuality. Perfect. I'll I'll throw something together. I'll entertain them while you figure out how to transition to your next thing for the camp. I do this thing a half hour, 35 minutes. Boys and girls walking up to me just bawling like why why don't you do this in schools you speak so real nobody ever speaks to us in this real tone uh do you ever think about doing that and then i was like wait a minute my acting really can do can do this like i and i knew that i could be powerful on the stage i just didn't realize though that it could be life transforming that was the part that it jumped out to me when i was uh and certainly not thinking life transforming from something coming from me directly. Yeah. And so I think that was the first time. And and what was it about the kids and that that fragile age of of fifth, sixth, seventh, ninth, tenth? Yeah. You know, what was it about that age that connected you to that that to that audience? In the first, the first one. Yeah. Well, in the first one, and and correct me if I'm wrong. Is a majority of your your trainings and and work with kids in schools correct? Yeah, most of it's with uh, students in middle school through high school and colleges. You know, that's the majority. And I also do, obviously, adults with conferences and, um, you know, leadership kind of seminars and that type of stuff. But the the thing that made me know I connected was that I in the beginning, I wasn't sharing much about my own personal story. Mm -hmm. I was able to turn my personal stories just into the characters without mm -hmm. people knowing what's me and what wasn't me. But when students started coming up to me and sharing their own personal stories and how they connected to what I was saying on stage, I realized, okay, I have something here. Something here is working for me. And Mikey, you know, you mentioned in your, in, on your website about the voices that, you know, crank call them when you were younger. Uh, you know, you have so many different ones. How how did you hone those? You know, what, how did you, you bring those to the stage? Yeah. Well, so so it actually went in the reverse, right? So part of like the the prank calling for me was I did not want to get caught. That petrified me. And I grew yeah. up in a time without caller ID or star 69. So I was like, okay, if I could keep on disguising voices, nobody's going to know it's me. You know, so I think so. I, and I'm not the kind that's imitating other people's voices so much as I am hearing a voice and then putting my own little twist on it mm -hmm. or my own kind of like transformation of that voice. And so when I started doing that though, 
it kind of got boring after a while. I think that's the part that I felt like, man, this is a wasted gift. You know, I'm using this thing to entertain me. And then I started to realize that when I was the saddest, if I was able to come up with monologues or poems that had different character voices in them, that some of my healing was taking place that I was able to transfer some of my sadness into some of these characters that I was creating. And that was really the jump off part for me that I was creating these characters when I was younger. I always had these voices of like the stories of people. I've always been drawn to collecting people's stories. And I found that I was able to heal some of my own pain when I was able to just share parts of my story. Yeah. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, watching uh, Education, Leadership and Beyond, this is Dr. Mikey Fallon. If you are watching live, leave us a comment, leave us a question. I'd like to make you part of the show uh, to be involved with us. And again, I appreciate Mikey being here with us. He worked today. Uh, I know he's got a busy schedule. Mikey, when you go into a, a, a school and whether you've been there or not, right, this year in Port Jervis, they were new kids, right? Most of them hadn't seen you. Um, what is it that you hope for in the audience uh, when you begin? I think initially when I'm on stage, I'm first reading the audience and I wanna see, okay, what's the vibe? And I can tell, and the great part about doing this for so many years is that I could walk in and within the first two or three minutes, I feel the vibe from the audience and I can say, okay, this is the way I'm gonna pace the show today. Or this is the character that I'm going to cut out or I'm going to add to this character because I think it will really speak to this audience in, in particular. Um, I think when, for me, when I'm on stage though, what, what happens is that I, I get out there and part of the passion and the drive is that I'm watching when people laugh the first time. And humor is huge. So humor is just, that that's a key part. If you can make somebody laugh, I feel like if I can, if I can get on stage and they're laughing a lot, I realize, wow, I have them. I have them. By the end of this show, they're going to be bawling. They're going to be crying. You know, mm -hmm. and that was true with your school. You know, I, they they were with me from the word go. And that that audience is a special audience to have because not every audience is that. You know, some mm -hmm. of them, some of the audiences I, I have, they're a lot more work. You know, I have to be able to adapt and adjust a little bit better in those in those situations. Yeah. And and day to day, you're adapting and, and tweaking your show and changing. But how has it changed over the years, Mikey? I mean, I've seen you about 10 years ago and, and now, you know, what are some things that you've added? There's been so many things that have happened in schools. Sure. Uh, the shootings and, and uh, so much awareness of uh, gay and straight alliance clubs and things like that. Has your show changed uh, over the years? Drastically. So my show is always changing. I think partly society, society deems it that way. So I think one of the first big changes that I had in my show was um, when Columbine, the school shooting at Columbine had happened. Mm -hmm. And that really transformed in a lot of ways and adjusted my own way of trying to approach the topic because everyone I think was harping on look at the evil that these two young men did, you know, like Dylan Klebold, Eric Harris. Wow. And then what I felt was they were so sad. These two young men were so sad. I wish I was there to speak and somehow inspire them to, to choose another path. Because I think with all of us, for those of us who end up on the side where we're trying to help and heal, we've had enough people who have been interceptors in our paths of, of self-destruction, you know, and I, mm -hmm. and I, and I think that those of us who don't or who take our pain and our sadness out on other people, I think that's one, one thing that happens is that they haven't had the right interceptors, the right people who have put them onto another path or, or redirected them. So I think stuff like Columbine, but then also just my own changes and challenges. I had a student that came up to me, years ago and she said you know you take us on this journey you make us feel emotional and then you leave do you understand anything of the emotional stuff the characters are talking about and i was like are you kidding you think i'm making this up along the way you think i don't know and so i realized at that point that people needed to hear my story mikey fowl and what parts 
are beyond the characters? What parts am I sharing that are really about my history, whether it's abusive situations, uh, family abusive or other abuses that happen from neighborhood kids, you know, like, like for me, that's really important to get out, you know, so a kid that had been molested can say, okay, I'm not the only one mm-hmm. or, or, or a child that's been like the weird kid can say, oh, it's okay to be different, okay to be strange. And I think more of my story has come out and the more of my story coming out has helped other people to feel emboldened to share theirs. And was that a challenge for you, Mikey, to kind of open that up in in front of a thousand strangers to say some of these challenges that you had growing up? I am blessed with the gift of being clueless when it comes <laughs> when it comes to self sharing, like I, I literally I had this conversation just at lunchtime today. I was sitting there and I was talking to to my uh, server and, and I said, you know, it's interesting. There are some people that just tell their truth, and they can be offending. They can offend somebody, and I don't have that. I'm very sensitive. I'm always wondering how people are receiving. Or are you okay? Where I don't always know is when I'm sharing very personal stories from my life. I'm just like, blah, and the people are like, wow, I've never had someone tell me that openly about the things they've been through. And uh, I, I'm glad because uh, honestly, if I if I had more of, uh, I wonder how it's going to be received, I think what happens in those moments is that I, I self-doubt and then I don't do it. You know, I won't take the risk. Well, when you come out with the character, I forgot her name, with the scarf, and you have that high-pitched voice, it's like, oh, my God, look at that. <laughs> and it sounds funny, but then you start getting into some serious yeah. topics. But if you were, yeah, timid or shy, maybe right. you wouldn't have done that character. Yeah? No, I wouldn't, no. And it, and it's what's great about doing Sabine is that, I, you know, I when I first start doing it, I watch the audience, but I can't tell you how many times a student will come up to me and they will say, I closed my eyes and I swear I thought it was a girl on stage, you know, and that's the highest praise. That's like, I, 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 when I hear that, I'm like, good, good, good. <laughs> uh, you said something interesting, Mikey. Um, again, the next day or that afternoon, uh, what what would you tell the adults to, to be on the lookout, right? It, you know, Mikey Fallon is here. The kids are emotional. You know, my guidance office, uh, when you present at a school, what are some things that the adults should be looking for after Mikey Fallon, after a school presenter, has got those emotions out, right? So I, so that's, I mean, that's a great, it's a great question because I think some schools uh, are not ready for the storm that I bring, right? Mm-hmm. And I think what ends up happening is that they do a disservice to their own students if they just rush them back to class without giving them time to debrief and process. Mm-hmm. I One of the things that if I have the conversation with an administrator or a counselor, I said, there's a couple things that you can do. Like you can have, you can prepare them, but not a lot. You know, there's not really, you have to see my show. You have to experience my show, my journey, my presentation, whatever late, whatever name that it's given, but you have to be there in the moment to take that journey. And so, but afterwards becomes critical. So some people want right away to do debriefing, which I don't, I think that I recommend that, but I also recommend maybe you debrief right away, but then you revisit a week later Mm -hmm. when a, a student may not feel as overwhelmed by their emotions and they're able to process some of the things that they saw in in the presentation and they're feeling a little more comfortable to talk about some of the topics that I bring up. Uh, when, when that happens, the other thing that I tell them is what is next? Because it's great that I come in and I, and I have people feeling and thinking, but if there isn't a follow-up in the school itself, like a month later, uh, and several months after that, then it becomes just a, an assembly that took them out of the class. Um, probably the best thing that I saw after one of my shows was the school that did this thing called the apology box. Mm. And about a week later, they set up a locked box outside of the cafeteria. 
And then they handed out a sheet of paper called an apology letter to every student in the school building. And they can write a letter or multiple letters or no letter if they didn't want to write a letter, but to somebody in the school that they had hurt in the past or have continued to hurt. And they could leave and they could make their, they could either put their names or it could be anonymous. But what, what we found in that school, what I found in that school, what they found in the school was that people who want to apologize to a specific person for hurting them want to own their name to it, which was awesome, right? Yeah. So, so a week, you know, they collect the letters in this box, the administrators or the, the student council, they go through it to make sure no letters are like harmful or just, you know, wisecracking kids. And then they hand out these apology letters to students who are receiving them. And I'm telling you, the healing that took place in that one school after my presentation, and then they do this apology box where students who had been hurt all their lives, who thought that their perpetrators were not even cognizant of what they were doing, they realized, wow, my pain mattered to you. I love it. That's, that's, that, that's yeah. it right there. That's a powerful uh, suggestion. I like that. And, uh, uh, you know, you were you weren't in our school that long ago. I wonder if we could still do that if not of this time, but next time. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mikey. Again, you have. I, I saw so many of our tough kids going up to you, hugging you, pound, giving you a pound, uh, the bro hug. You know, these are kids that they're strangers to you, but after your assembly, they connected. What are some of the things that kids are telling you? What are some of the top things? Uh, affecting our kids today that you're you're hearing after your performances? Hmm. Well, I think uh, actually a real big one is the idea of isolation and feeling alone, um, which is an interesting one, right? Here we are, we're supposedly so much more connected to the world than when, you know, you or I were growing up. And so, but now because of all the connection, there is no real connection of conversation. You know, I can't tell you how many times my daughter in her life with her, she's a ninth grade student, but how many times she's had a conversation on the phone or even FaceTime. She'll do FaceTime sometimes, but a conversation with just her friends talking about things, you know, and, and I, I hear that. And it's, and it's not uncommon to other students, other kids that they use more social media for quick broken sentences to communicate than it is for like face to face. So kids that really need that, I think they feel more alone. That's one of the things like people come up and tell me. The other part that I sometimes don't realize is that I provide, making myself vulnerable gives permission to other students and other people to feel vulnerable and to allow themselves to feel vulnerable. I had a student a few weeks ago in a middle school and uh came up to me and and he shook my hand and this and and so i, I looked at this this boy and i said man this kid is an anxious kid and i said he's probably a straight a student it was a top performing middle school in the state that i was in and he shook my hand and was dripping with sweat and i was like yep yep i have this kid pinned i know what he is he's an anxious straight a student socially awkward and he said he introduced himself and he said your show meant a lot today to me it really helped me out and then he paused and he said, I'm a survivor of the Sandy Hook school shooting. Ah, wow. I mean, I was blown away, right? So here's a, so, so if I talk to Parkland School and I talk to those students there, I bet that as horrible as that tragic day was, they have memories of when they've been to school that have been safe, that they hadn't had worry about that prior to that happening talking to a person that when they were six or seven years old, their first school experiences, watching your best friends get gunned down, how do you heal? You know, And that was the question I asked the principal. How do you help that student heal? And he looked at me and he said, I have no clue. I don't know. We just try to give as much support as we can, but we do not know how to help someone believe that this place is safe. Wow. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. So I give a student like that, for example, that moment, that hour and a half moment of saying, I'm not alone. I'm safe. I, I am safe right now. Someone understands what I feel when I feel anxiety and I feel terrified just to live. Yeah. Wow. And uh, to our audience, this is Dr. Mikey Fallon. 
Uh, he's an actor, he's a poet, he's a psychologist, uh, and he's a tremendous asset to students and schools. Uh, so if you have a question, you're watching live, please put a question on there uh, or a comment. Uh, we'll certainly get the, the information that you can uh, book Mikey to come to your schools. Mikey, how, how many shows a year do you do? I mean, and and uh, the first question, do you, are you a practicing psychologist in addition to the shows? Or are you primarily speaking now? Yeah, so no, no, no practice in psychologists. It's just, it'd be unfair to any of uh, clients or anything like that. I just travel around way too much and I'm, I'm constantly doing these things. So, I mean, it, it's hard to say, but I would say in a given year, yeah, you know, if I, I would say anywhere between 250 to 300 presentations. Wow. Yeah, so, and you know, and traveling all across the country, there were several years where during the summertime I'd go over to Europe to do some presentations as well. Um, and yeah, and, I, and the, the crazy part is that people like people who wanted to be in this business, if you will, of speaking, they've asked me like, how do I get into it? And I'm the worst business model. Like I, I do the advertising. I barely do any advertising. Like it's not any advertising, like major advertising. I should say, it's not that I do barely any advertising. I don't do the amount that other people who sort of worked the time, worked the ground a little bit. But what ends up happening is that every time that I've really pushed my presentations to schools, it's backfired. Like it's like been like, okay, I'm just, I'm lumped into that group of other motivational speakers if they mm -hmm. can't see me, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I've realized to let it go and the best advertisement is like yourself. Like you, you saw me. And you're like, okay, I was really affected. My students were affected. I need to get this word out. Mm -hmm. That has been what has made it 250 to 300 shows a year. Yeah. And uh, it, absolutely, because people say, hey, I'm looking for someone uh, to impact my school. And it's like, bam, you know, you had Mikey there, and, and you're certainly someone that can do that. Does it get hard for you, Mikey, to – kind of put yourself out there every day and the pouring of emotions, like, how, you know, is that difficult for you? Not anymore. You know, I think at first it was because I I'd had to go to some really dark places that yeah. it wasn't comfortable doing it the first bunch of times. And I think now when I go to those places and I, and as a actor as well, one of the things is that I'm very much in tune with the, uh, emotional realism. So I, I'm definitely calling on places that are scary to look at for me, you know? So when I'm up there and I, and I tell students, so I'm up there and I'm crying, I'm not faking tears, you know, I'm not trying to cry. I'm going to some very dark places and to bring up that emotion. But I'm also, I also have this other gift of compartmentalization that I know when I'm done, I have to let it go, that I can't just stay in that space. When I first started doing these presentations, I couldn't let it go. Like I couldn't talk to students. I couldn't talk to anyone after. Like they used to just put me off to a side room and like what I was doing at these camps. Okay, we know Mikey needs his time now to come back down, come back to earth. And God, it was just so heavy that yeah. you know, I took like 45 minutes and hours to be able to just come back to myself. Mikey, and again, I've seen you have a great impact on the students um, you know, I, I call my staff, you know, first responders, my, my teachers, my, my, you know, everyone who's right there with the kids each and every day. Do you do trainings, uh, you know, for the adults? And, and with those adults, what advice today would you give here on the show for them to look for some warning signs, right? My, class, my teacher tomorrow has a class of 25 kids in front of them. What are some warning signs that that adult can look for? You know what I've, I've found? I found that um, the warning signs are sometimes the things that teachers are already paying attention to. The student that they're not reaching or thinking they're not reaching, uh, the, the student that's distracted or something just seems off. My English teacher in high school, my sophomore year, I didn't realize it, but she was seeing my isolation. She saw my distance and my sadness and she reached out and all she said was you eat lunch every day alone in the cafeteria i'm inviting you to sit with me in my classroom if you want to and have lunch and talk or not talk but i want you to know my door is always open and you're not alone 
And that was so powerful to me because it was somebody acknowledging that they can see me. They didn't just see me as a student or a grade in their classroom. So I think one of the things is to trust your instinct is what I say to teachers, trust your instinct. You see those students in your classroom that there's something off, something you're not connecting with them, trust that. And if you're not the person that they feel safe enough to go to, figure out what teachers or what other colleagues that you may have that may be able to reach that student, that specific student um, and be willing to, I, I, and I, I just had a presentation down in Delaware with the uh, staff members of this school district, private school. And I, and I said to them, look, I used to get frustrated when I used to speak in schools that were, uh, you know, to tougher school districts where, you know, the students, they weren't getting what I was doing. For whatever reason, I'll do it in any other school and all the students would somehow understand or emotionally allow themselves to let me in. And then this, like certain school districts were really tough and they were urban school districts and they were either made up of mostly black students or Latino Hispanic students. And I was so frustrated that I would walk away and every time I would say, why don't they get it? And then I watched The Matrix and I watched it for like, I don't know how many times. And I saw this scene where the main character, he has this little boy in this room who's, who's bending a spoon with it, just staring at it. And the, the boy says to Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, hey, you want to try to bend a spoon? And, and he takes the spoon and he looks at it. And the boy says, do not try to bend a spoon with your mind. That is impossible. Just remember the truth. There is no spoon, but it's your mind that has to bend first. And then you'll see the spoon that follows. And I realized the problem in those schools wasn't the kids. It's me. That I had to adapt. I had to be willing to, to change whatever format I thought, which was perfect, into what they needed where they were. Powerful story, uh, Mikey. And you can add teacher to your uh, repertoire there because uh, yeah. absolutely adapting to your audience. Um, Mikey, we're going to get to uh, people being able to get in touch with you. Um, and I have in here about asking about your favorite quote. But before we do that, tell me the story again about being culturally sensitive I love the story about the hot cup of tea and the person yelling, grabbing at that. Tell that story again about you know yeah. being culturally aware and culturally sensitive. Uh, tell that story, please. Okay. So I so I came up with this this whole thing that I've now I've called the Japanese teacup philosophy, and I grew up using teacups in my home that have handles on them, and then I started eating at a lot of sushi restaurants. And every time I would order green tea, it would come over into a cup that had no handle. And I never understood why Japanese teacups had no handles until one, one night sitting at a restaurant in my town, I ordered green tea and the waiter brings it over in a cup that has no handle. And I was just impulsively blurting out what I was experiencing in that moment. And even though I do this work on diversity and understanding differences, I look at the guy and I ask him, what's wrong with your teacups? And he just laughed, but he taught me a better lesson. He taught me that when someone asks you a question that may be offensive or based out of their ignorance, that it's best not to handle it by cursing them out or ripping them apart or labeling them. And he just smiled and he said, if it's too hot to hold, it's too hot to drink. And from that moment, though, that became my philosophy of how I want to see people and interact with people that I'm less interested in the fancy handles that they may have on their teacups than I am with their stories and the temperature inside that cup and what people are bringing to the table that actually connects us to each other. That's a powerful story. Uh, I love it. The Japanese teacup philosophy. Yeah. Put it in your toolbox. That's it. Uh, if you're watching live, this is Dr. Mikey Fallon. Again, leave us a question, a comment. My mother's watching today, Mikey, so it must be a special show. <laughs> <laughs> give a shout out there. Nice. Mikey, let's get to some rapid fire questions. Uh, these are quick answers, uh, you know, right, right, whatever comes out. So last book you read. They both die in the end. That's what it's called. Okay. Good book? Good book. Good okay. Book. Uh, the last movie you saw? I uh, just saw one last night called Alita. It's in the movie theaters now. Yeah. 
What do you give it on the? Uh, what are you giving it on the scale? Ah, uh, let's say scale. It's entertaining, but it's not like you're not gonna walk away really moved. But it, but it, you know what? It did its job. I enjoyed it, and so you know, for that, for the category of science, science fiction, you know, action, it was pretty good. Okay, favorite place to travel? Huh. Okay, so there, there, there's actually I was gonna say, well, uh, let's go with Minneapolis. Okay. Uh, best thing about being a speaker and actor. Hmm. Watching. So the best way to say it is like certain words are often used as negative or positive, but like the word manipulation. But if you use it in a positive way, you have the ability to help people without you have the ability to help people to see themselves a little bit differently. So when I get on stage, I know how to make people laugh and how to make people cry. And so I use my, the, the gift of manipulation, but not to hurt them, but use them to help them to say, okay, I now understand this person a little bit better, or now understand myself a little bit better. And so I think that's the best part of being on stage is reading an audience and being able to understand how I can, twist and move them along a path in order to see themselves and others better. What's the, one of the greatest challenges you have in your job? Hmm. Not, not feeling defeated. If enough people in an audience, it didn't really connect to that audience. You know, that's hard. That's that, that, that still is hard, you know? Yeah. Something that motivates you is lyrics and music. Who's your favorite artist? Well, you know, I have quite a bit, but right now, I, I this guy named Connor Oberst, I think he gets me the most in his lyrics. He's a singer songwriter, he's been with a number of different bands, but he does solo projects as well. And uh, when he writes his lyrics, sometimes it's it's just like, yep, you just spoke to me. You spoke part of my truth. Best purchase under a hundred bucks that has had the greatest impact on your life. The book, All I Really Need to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. Mm. Very cool. Three most important qualities you need to be an effective public speaker. One is to be quick on your feet, like to deal with the distractions that may come up in an, in an audience. You know, I've I've been in an audience where people have start throwing up on each other. You know, so you have to be yeah. So you have to be able to adjust and adapt. That's the one big thing. The other part is to listen to people's stories, or in, no matter where you are, and to be able to turn them into something that you can use when you're on stage. And I think the third part for me uh, in order to be a speaker and actor and performer is that ability to always be willing to adjust and to stay current. If you can offer uh, parents advice, Mikey, from your trainings, from your work in the field of psychology, um, and my next book coming out, little plug here, is called The Parents Surviving and Thriving. You know, what what tip would you offer uh, to parents uh, with their kids? Uh, one that I actually put into practice myself is talking to your kids uh, and allowing their truth to stand as their truth. And what I mean is that, you know, sometimes I think parents hear the problems that their children have and they laugh it off like you think that's a problem and you don't have a tough life and other people have it worse. And I think that damages a child more than they realize. And so what I've what I've learned or try to help parents to to understand is figure out a way that you can listen to your child, but talk to your child about your truth as well. That I feel like my parents did not. My parents try to protect us. But in doing so, they made me specifically less connected to them growing up. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Short-term personal goal, three to five months. Uh, Short-term personal goal right now is to uh, do some more editing on this book that's been sitting there that I've been 
reworking and writing and uh, I want to, you know, just try to edit some of more of the essays that I've written. Um, I probably have enough essays for several books. So, you okay. know, just trying to figure out what yeah. I really want in. And uh, what's the title that going to be? You have that? No, that changes. It constantly changing. So I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah, I've written down a number of titles. So like I'm kind of and I'll, I'll actually figure out the title better once I see. OK, here are all the pieces mm -hmm. that are going to go into it. Um, but it'll be something pithy. That's for sure. Yeah. Cool. When it comes out, we'll have you back on the program. Uh, long term personal goal, three to five years. Three to five years. Um, I think one of my goals, I guess, and I don't really, it's funny. I, I try not, I set goals for myself, but they're usually very short term. My, my ADD is a thing that if I set it too far in the future, it tends not to get done. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that I really want to do is to visit Sweden and to be able to sit at a restaurant and have a conversation with either a waiter or a bartender just about life in Sweden but in Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Nice. If anyone watching uh, here has connections in Sweden, Mikey Fallon is trying to get there. Mikey, what's next for you? You've been doing this. You're doing several hundred shows a year. you got a book on the horizon. What's next for Mikey Fallon? I think, um, you know, I actually had a conversation with one of my buddies about that, and I, and I think one of the things that it's how can I – pass on not what I do because not everyone can get up on stage and speak in front of hundreds or thousands of people. So I get that. But how can I take the themes of what I do to maybe conduct workshops to, for training people to sort of like take the messages or the way of how or the ideas, I should say, and to, to put them into their own personality. Yeah. You know, for some people, it's to run small groups. Other people, it's to start projects or to be very socially active over some of the themes that I that I discuss or I bring forth. And I think that's one of the things I want to do to figure out how can I maybe during the summer get groups of students that will work on an action plan they'll take back to their school. That'll be year long. You know, and I, I don't but I don't know how to do that. That's the that's the that's where. I need to rely on others to help me with that because that's sure. not really my thing is a solo thing and I'm more comfortable solo thing than leading, you know, in that format. Yeah. Well, I think you have something there and kind of, you know, thinking about the opening concept, I know you heard it, you know, they they all have a voice. Everyone has a voice. And, and I take that very seriously as a school leader. Uh, but in that, I think you would be great at that in training people to bring out their voice to help others, right? You train the trainers, right? What's that saying about uh, you teach a kid to fish till the, they can eat for every day? You teach others. I'm going to screw it up. Jared Kamar says it. Well, all you, right, 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 right. No, 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 yeah, yeah. So you catch a fish, to, uh, you know. You eat for a day. Yeah. Right. They eat for a day, and then you teach someone how to fish, and they eat for a lifetime, right? Yep. But then if you teach others, how to fish you can feed the world you right. know and, and i think you can do that and uh if you're listening and you want to connect with mikey on that uh mikey how can people get in touch with you uh they can get in touch with me through the website uh which is mikey fowlin when mikey is spelled m-y-k-e-e -E, fowlin is spelled f-o-w-l-i-n so mikey okay. mm -hmm. and i know you have someone that helps you uh uh, yep. With your bookings, and they and Tessin would reach out to them, right? Tessin will, yeah, right. So they reach out to Tessin, and she'll communicate uh, with them and be able to set up the arrangements, uh, time wise, fee wise, and all that. Great, great. And I definitely would recommend that. Uh, if you're a school district watching the show, uh, you're looking for a motivational speaker, you're looking for someone to really impact your kids and your staff. I mean, Mikey transformed my building. And again, seeing those kids come and hug Mikey afterwards, it was powerful. So um, this is Mikey Fallon, everyone. Mikey, uh, let's definitely get that out there. I think you would have something uh, in your future about, again, training the trainers. I would love to brainstorm with you for real. Okay, great. 
Mike, I didn't check with you before the in the pre-show uh, meeting here. How about a quote? Do you have a favorite quote that you go by? Yeah, I have two, you know, that really that affect even my work. And one of them is by this singer-songwriter, Ani DeFranco. And she says, they can call me crazy if I fail. All the chance that I need is one in a million. And then they can call me brilliant if I succeed. And that's one of my favorite ones. And then the other one is by that guy who wrote All I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And he had another book called It Was on Fire When I Lay Down on It. And he said in that book, he said, the line between good and evil, hope and despair, does not divide the world between us and them. It runs down the middle of all of us. I do not want to talk about what you understand about the world. I want to know what you will do about it. I do not want to know what you hope. I want to know what you will work for. And I do not want your sympathy for the needs of humanity. I want your muscle. As the wagon driver said, as they came to the long, hard hill, them that's going on with us, get out and push. Them that ain't, get out of the way. And so that's those are my two driving ones. That was something. Just a little touch of your acting and your speaking right there. Uh, Dr. Mikey Fowler, I really thank you, Mikey, for making time. I know you got a busy schedule, uh, and it was great to talk to you. I love it. Love it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, get in touch with Mikey again. His website uh, is MikeyFallon.com, and that's W uh, M Y K E E. Uh, check him out. Uh, tremendous resource. And uh, uh, we're going to sign off here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. And uh, thrilled to have Mikey Fallon on. Mikey, continue to go out and impact kids in schools. And, and I thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, all right. We'll get this music queued up. No lyrics in this music, Mikey, just my little theme song. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Continue to go out and change the world for the better uh, and do great work in your schools. And, and as Mikey Fallon does each and every day, uh, let's impact those kids' lives. Thanks, Mikey. Thank you. All right. Have a good one.